And we are back. Welcome again to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I am your host, John Dayton, welcoming you to Mighty Episode 15. 15. I feel like that's significant somehow, but it's probably not. Uh, joining me again tonight, we are at the luxurious Shea Kuzabucky out on the Grand Lawn, enjoying a summertime campfire, which you can hear snapping and popping nearby. You can hear all the night creatures. And uh, too bad it's not a video podcast. You can see the guys reacting to me, blinding them with my headlamp. At least it's red. <laughs> yeah, where's that nice blue blinding dot so we can blind ourselves from miles away? It's got a green power light. Anyway, the... Uh, hold on a second here. Get my headphones on. All right. It's, uh, the exciting thing tonight here is that we have a uh, new Motu interface that I got for work. Eight in, eight out, FireWire or USB. Not bus powered, so we have the inverter out here. Hopefully that holds up for the duration. And uh, so yeah, now instead of everybody shouting at my laptop, we all have our own microphones, which may or may not work out. Well, maybe next time we'll get one of those nice little stereo mic stand things and uh, shoot a pair of eighty ones across. See how that works out. You could try that, and then we can get a large diaphragm condenser yeah. out here. Checking out your MXL. I'm trying to figure out why oh, my mic sounds so bad and your guys sound so. Are you guys both on condensers? Uh, no, he's on a fifty-seven. Huh, I'm on a 57 It's a little dark out here, but... Maybe I just sound weird because I have headphones on. No, that's better. If they're actually on my ears and not on my forehead, I can hear a lot better. It's been a long week, folks. I rolled over today, got up, went through a long old day, and then remembered, holy cow, I have a blog. Sort of like the forgotten stepchild. So hopefully I'll get something, get back in. It's not on purpose, though. We don't We don't mean to forget about you. Just, um, We're actually really glad that you're there. It gives yeah. us sort of a purpose in life to, to have this to do, even though it's more work for us to have something to... This is the nice unwinding part of this our is the, week. This is the recreational work, the, yes. the labor of love. Um, but yeah, proud to announce uh, we got our first bit of fan mail last week uh, from Germany. We're actually not sure if it was a, a fellow or a lady that dropped us a line because apparently Ike is one of those names like Kim or Pat that go either way so we're, we're waiting to find out big fan of kim thale so i'm i'm hoping it's a guy it, it could not be i would be okay with that too anyway so there's that uh we picked up a couple new followers a couple uh couple people popped up on twitter this week got another follower on the uh the blogger site so i'm pumped about that was taking a look through the stats and uh despite <laughs> posts being somewhat slim pickings lately um we're uh, we we are red in forty seven states in America and really? yeah in thirty eight wow. thirty eight countries. That's awesome. That's pretty darn. I mean, good. not extensively. Like porn you know. bots are doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking at the uh, we, we've got a few steady readers definitely in Germany, the UK, Canada, and uh, in Russia apparently, which I still I won't believe it until I actually hear from a Russian reader. Not that I will know what they're saying unless they're kind enough to write in English because I'm not that worldly. So, we uh, enough housekeeping. Uh, actually, I should say it first instead of last. I always save it for the end. But uh, if you're just tuning in, if you're not familiar, we uh, this originally started as a blog for uh, a couple of kids who volunteer at the church where I work just to kind of get some concepts thrown at them. The whole idea being not to sort of write a white paper that would be the last word on audio, but just to provoke some thoughts a couple colleagues got involved, a couple other people started reading it, pretty soon it took off and we, we had some readership and uh, a couple of us listened to some podcasts as well to brush up our chops on a number of things, so we decided, hey, we can do that. Those guys sound just like we do every time we get together and since we don't really know how to speak to or interact with normal people and we can kind of half interact with musicians, we decided the, the best thing would be just to talk to other sound guys. And You and, said uh, scary things, talking to normal people. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not any good at it. So so anyway, here we are. You get one full hour of nerd speak every week that we can manage it, and uh, hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully you keep tuning in. It's a little harder to tell because I, I post this thing in two different places, and um, I don't get any indication as to whether people who find us on YouTube actually watch the whole, like listen to the whole thing or if they just like click on it and then click away, so... Some of those may be false positives, but it looks, the, the appearances are that we get about um, about 20 hits a week a week rather on uh, on the podcast, so that's pretty encouraging. So that's more people that, than pay attention to me 
<laughs> in the flesh on a weekly basis. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So the topic tonight, if we can manage to stay awake and if the inverter holds out that long, is uh, how to keep a campfire going until you fall asleep under the stars. No, it's not. It's, Old Christmas uh, trees that have hung out my backyard are uh, a great fire starter, too. <laughs> It's, it's August, and found a Christmas tree and a pile of stuff, and that just it really helped. Really did. Not to spend an entire entire bottle of lighter fluid or charcoal star to get this thing going this week. Well, come on, where's your sense of adventure? Get the gas. <laughs> that well, since my neighbor is as a kid, literally melted his face off. I'm a little bit against pouring gas in fires. Um, okay, used motor oil. All right. We'll go with but, a safer. Well, route. I mean, it wasn't a good idea to stand <laughs> yeah. over a fire with a five right. gallon. Oh, five get ga- Yeah, that that'd be a lot. I might need to put the headphones on. I can barely hear you guys since I took them <laughs> off over the tree yeah, frogs sorry, and the cicadas yeah. and every other thing. But at least the two quiet talkers have microphones they can put right up to their lips and. That's true. Deliver silky smooth messages of audio mm. love. Mm. The soothing Baby, sounds of all Marvin Gaye on you. late audio. nights mm. with SNR makes me happy. <laughs> I'm gonna bring my bass amp out next time. Yeah, Let's play some silky sweet Motown. <laughs> mm. We'll try and find somebody you can play in the pocket. <laughs> Call teaspoon. It got real quiet. Yet. <laughs> it's like not any us. I know. We're I know. I know. Sides. I know. I'm a little bit short on the melanin, but I make it work. Right. In the summer, anyway, you're plenty tan. Tan enough. <laughs> so anyway, enough babbling. And if we haven't offended. Our entire audience. Sorry. Yeah, just three quarters. <laughs> I'd really like to play bass, not like a white guy. I'm working on it. Working on it. I heard, though, if you can detect groove, you can train yourself to play it. So if you can tell when something's in the pocket, hold out hope. There's hope for you. I have no doubt that despite your, your Jewish ancestry, you can be, <laughs> you too can someday be deep in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> we, hey, we've had a lot of hard times, too. I mean, you guys should be good at like deep in the pocket. Like, well, some of us are. Everybody else got classically trained, and uh, well, it's a it's a parent thing. Yep. If you're not a doctor or a lawyer or a classical musician, you've kind of failed. Or well, an accountant to get out of our pockets, right? Yeah, and <laughs> everything that's in the pockets is gone into a, a fairly large bank somewhere. Thanks, that's, Goldman Sachs. That's how a show devolves right there, is you put three exhausted engineers. As a side note, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play that game where we crow about how much we've been working and how long the hours are and how tired we are, but the oh, uh, it's so hard. Eh, eh, no, we, we love it. We we and eat someone that turn stuff off the heat. <laughs> and turn the oxygen back on. Yes, please. But uh, we were counting up a couple of us over dinner tonight. We have a little production group which is just this, uh, a bunch of owner operator sound and lighting guys. We think that uh, we covered between us 30-some dates in the month, like 32 or 33 dates in the month of July. So that's pretty cool for five guys. We were, And, and two, I think and we were only weekends. counting like <laughs> three of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the majority of those were three of us. A couple of guys slipped, chipped in there to help out. But that was... Uh, it was a very, very good month. It's been July been very, very good to me. Yeah. Not that I have anything left in my bank account to prove it. But yeah, I was, was going to say, I think most of it ended up in the gas tank, but yeah, what are you going to do? That was a help. So, now that we're... I'm not even going to look to see how many minutes we're in. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the idea behind tonight's podcast, uh, and we were hoping to have Carl here because he has a lot of good info on this, but maybe we'll, we'll do like we did with the compressor show where we say our piece and then we give him a chance later on. Um, and this might become sort of a topic for everybody who's a guest on our show at, at one point or another. Um, so we, uh, a lot of what we deal with, a lot of the questions that we answer, I mean, when we talk to each other, we just, we, we spew techno jargon like it's going out of style and we all sort of get it and, and wallow in it. Uh, the problem is when you have to talk to a, you know, a neophyte or a non-skilled person, and that's actually not where we're going. Where we're going is uh, a lot of the questions we get asked are like, you know, what do you do? What do, you do? How do you get started in the business? Some people uh, hear what we have to say and don't run away screaming and stick with it, pursue it, start buying gear, start doing gigs, or start, you know, doing gigs with us. And um, so the, the question, I'm going to see how long I can draw this out now. Can we make it to the halfway mark without actually saying what the topic is? <laughs> I have faith. The, uh, you want to talk about me being a Jew some more? <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, there's there's at least 20 minutes in backstory. You bring right it up there. more than anybody else. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. 
It's the only way I knew. And you're only what, like one twenty fourth Jewish or something like that? Twelve and a half percent. Um, uh, so it's, he, it's he's less than a good if, beer. If, no, <laughs> listen. If if it was all right, I'd, we're going to lose followers here. I'm sure. So the topic. If, if it was if it was the forties, I wouldn't be around. Go on. <laughs> That's right. Follow that with the nerds speak. Why don't you? Oh boy. And math and. Well, I'm not the German I'm, in the group, so I'm just going to let yeah, that I think lie. out of respect, we need to leave Behringer out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the topic, drum roll, please. What we're going to talk about tonight is what our go-to inputs are. And I'm, this isn't really an original idea. If you listen to Pensado's Place, which if you're not, you need to. Um, even if you're not interested in re- uh, mixing and mastering records, the the concepts that get discussed on a weekly basis by some serious heavy hitters it's, are... It's, it's very interchangeable. Yeah, stuff crosses over so easy. It's very worth your time. So uh, he does this thing called the batter's box. I'm not even going to pretend like like I'm not stealing it. Sorry, Dave. Hope you listen someday. We love you. Mwah. Don't don't sue. Don't sue. Love my, you. My mean friends it. Don't ever law school yet, so we can't do that. So what he'll do is he'll go through like eight or ten or twelve. You know, for this input, what's your go-to mic? What's your go-to compressor? And he'll just do a quick rundown with guys. So since we have a little bit more time, because it's going to be the whole show, we're going to talk about. Um, Anthony's Judaism. Our, uh, we're going to try and weave that into every question if possible. We'll just start it at channel one with a kick and run through a typical input list. Or Actually, what I thought we'd do is start with like small bar band. What, what do you do? Small band, small room, small system. Then uh, let's say larger band, possibly with an international flavor, larger stage outdoors. What do you do? Um, we'll probably stay. We'll do another a whole, we'll do another episode for studio because that's really a whole other world. And, and what yeah. you would do, maybe we'll get into it tonight, maybe not. What you would do if money was no option? Yeah, we could bar go there. band, large scale, rec- whatever. That, yeah, um, that'll be like the tail. The, the last one, the quick thought will be like, yeah, what, what's the uh, the gold? Earth works on everything. Yeah, Thank what's, you. What's the gold Amex <laughs> so, choice? I've got one of those. <laughs> At least a picture of one. It still works for now. <laughs> Even though we can the guy. I still got it. Why are you bugging me about microphones? Let's go shopping. Yeah. They're a lot tighter with that now. <laughs> they, I got a phone call today, actually, about I just I put in a purchase order or a check request for Sennheiser. I need to send out one of my microphones to get fixed. And before, with the old guy, I would write, microphone in main room needs to get fixed. However many dollars, thank you. And I got a phone call today asking me, well, what's wrong with it and all this stuff, all this information that the way I got around it before was just I made the guy feel like he was a part of it. I made him feel like he was smart and used big words like audio interchange and interconnect. And really all I probably needed was a bunch of cable ends. <laughs> um, but now now they actually want to know what I'm spending money on. It's kind of, it's. It's nice, but at the same time, it's... Uh, you shouldn't have to justify yourself to an accountant. Right. Well, it's not the accountant. It's the executive pastor, so he actually needs to know what's going on. Yeah. And it's, well, that's it's, good, though. It's nice to know that someone cares and isn't just saying no because they don't like me, whether or not because I'm Jewish or not. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could think Carl's not here. That's all Snap. this... <laughs> That's all this show needs is <laughs> is, is one more Polish enough, person hating enough, on another Polish Jew. <laughs> enough cynicism to sink it. <laughs> so with no further ado, let's just dive into it. You're in a small club. You're on a small system. Channel one, kick drum. There's no second kick drum mic. What are you putting in there? Let's go to Gordon first. We'll start with you every time. Oh, man, every time, huh? Uh, lately, I've been favoring the uh, D6, although I do find it a little bit on the weak side for sealed kick drum heads, which I still end up going with a D112 or maybe a 91. Yeah, like a, I, that's actually, um, that's what I've been doing all week. I've got a, a pearl kit with a sealed head. But I just, I honestly, I haven't gotten around to just getting an exacto knife out and cutting a hole in that sucker. <laughs> yeah. But it really does. Like, I've got enough attack out of it, and there's enough boom in the little cage that we got where it really does. It covers everything that I need to. I've got enough punch out of it. Just um, single 18s aside. Uh, but it, it, it's coming through really nice for, for what I need. There's a little side note on that. There's two things you can do if you get a kick drum without a hole in the front head. That's the head facing the audience, the non-beater head. The one with the logo on it, usually. Right. Yeah. You can either 
move the move the mic around to the beater side and flip, not the phase, but the polarity, children. Uh, oh, <laughs> we're not doing, we're awesome. not doing that show again. <laughs> Uh, you can either flip phase on it, or you can cut a hole in the front head. Um, which, d- which if if you own the drum kit, it's okay. But if it's somebody else coming in, they get real, real itchy about that. That's that's usually not an option. And, but the thing that I've found that that makes that okay is if you go out, um, order a couple of these on the internet, or find them at your local drum shop. I know Remo makes them. I'm sure somebody else does. Uh, you can get a. I think Remo's was a three pack. You got like a four, five, and six inch reinforcement ring yep. that you stick to the drum head first, and that's pretty important because you can yeah. you can tear up a front head pretty yeah, fast. No, I mean you you can't really draw a perfect circle. Yep. And I haven't done it. You know, if it's if it's a one shot where I'm I'm running into a drummer for the first time, I won't bother. I'll just I'll either make do with you know make them tune the front head and find the resonant spot on it. You can actually tap around with your finger on that front head. When you find the spot where it sounds good, that's where you put the mic. Or uh, if that's not working out due to stage volume or whatever, you can sneak it around, put it right next to the beater, and, and get some attack out of it. Um, but I actually had a couple of bands years ago. Uh, twice it happened where I was getting a band constantly that the kid just didn't have a hole. I bought that Remo kit. I put a 4-inch hole on one kid's kit and a 5-inch hole on another one. They were comfortable with it. They didn't really have any choice. I was bigger, scarier, hairier, <laughs> grungier than definitely, they were. Definitely and hairier. I looked right. like Rob Zombie at the time. They, yeah, I they could definitely see John being hairier. Bigger? I don't know. I was bigger than them. I mean, oh, okay. I'm not Four, 14, 14 year olds are I, uh, yeah, pretty yeah, easy. When, to when threatened, I, I'm able to swell to twice my size to frighten off oh, predators. Like a bullfish. He's fierce. got a giant tail. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can push horns. that thing out like a squirrel and <laughs> frighten off predators and bouncers. Um. So yeah, that's uh, that's it for now. What did, what did you uh, did you chime in on on kick single mic? Um, kick mic is single mic. I, if there is a hole, um, if I've got one mic, I like uh, I our friend Kevin, who I haven't heard from in a long time, um, got this neat mic and technique where you stick a, a Beta fifty two inside, but you shoot it towards the batter head. So you put it in the hole and shoot it towards the top corner, like you turn it around, right. Um, and you get tons of thud. You get tons of tons of attack, and it's, it's shell really, sound. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a yeah. nice sound. I actually did it with some of the stuff that I was recording because I was limited to uh, to twelve inputs off of uh, a long snake that I had, and the kid had five toms and two ride cymbals and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it came out really great. I ran it through the Joe Meek. Um, didn't use the compressor at all because he was he was dead on with with what I wanted. Um, but it, it a nice fat. With attack, kick drum sound, and it. I mean, I, I've tried to do it on other kits, and it just didn't work as well. It worked really well on a 22 inch maple kick. Cool. And mine would be the uh, Shure Beta 52. Yep. Which um, I I did use D112s for a long time because that was kind of the de facto thing, and I was a metal guy and mixing a lot of metal bands, and it's a great attack mic. And I know studio guys love them for everything. I I never understood why. It may have had more to do with the fact that my subs were drastically underpowered in those days than that it's actually a crappy mic for low frequencies. It's good for jazz too, though. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's got what you what you need in it. Yep. And the the Beta Fifty Two, it's it's definitely a what do you want to call it a color mic. I yep. mean, it's it's it does some extra to your sound, which is not always good, but pretty much always good. It's a pretty that, good mic. It, and the uh, the PG PG version, PGX PG version, 52, the bargain. Yeah. yeah. Eh, it's. It's okay. It's uh, it's cheaper for a reason. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely not being all that it could be, but in a pinch, um, uh, I really popped my pee on that. I'm gonna have to hold the mic out to the side. In a pinch, uh, it's better than probably almost anything else. The PG52 on on the cheap scale, at least. Like it, che- yeah, it's, it'll, it'll beat out the CAD mics and the oh yeah, whatever. I I don't know what else, but even, even um, in the studio, Joey on all of his records and. and I mean, you, you've heard, John, you've heard Joey's records. Oh, yeah. Um, Sounds like angels made one, it. One kick mic positioned properly in that thing. You don't need an in mic. You don't need an out mic. You just one Beta 52, um, and he makes it sound like magic, and all he really does is adds, uh, sorry to get off topic, but in the studio, he adds an SSL channel strip plug-in mm-hmm. through a nice tube pre, which is usually the MPA gold that oh, I'm still going to break into Gordon's house and steal one of them. Um <laughs> Runs it through that, and it, it sounds it sounds great. There's there's nothing. Why must the Jews always steal? Huh? <laughs> steal everything. I'm Jewish. If it's free, we go. 
Mm. All right, so another topic covered. That took 27 <laughs> minutes to cover Channel One. <laughs> this might become a series, kids. If we're we, gonna make we'll, it through the drum kit we'll by let one you know, a.m. If we if we ever get to the right of the master section, we'll call you. Um, if you're waiting on that vocal channel, it might take a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, that's and on the uh, for me with that that Beta 52, I'm going inside the shell on that. Um, yep. A lot of guys will go right to the hole in the in the front head. Um, but I don't do that unless I have a second mic because things are really windy there. You lose a lot of low end. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. You lose a lot of you lose attack. a lot of beater sound. I like yeah. to get inside when I'm just using one mic. I go f- four to eight inches away from the beater head and a little bit off center. Usually um, about I, at least I personally go about halfway, maybe angle it in. Like mm-hmm. if you get halfway inside the shell, angle it in just a touch so it's not pointing directly at the beater, maybe two or three inches off. Yep. But. Yeah, you don't want to ever point it right at the beater. Go a little yeah. bit away from it. That'll help you out a lot. Yeah, no, I always try to, granted, sometimes it's a pain to try and get through those holes because they're tiny, but I always try to get probably about two-thirds of the way through the shell and then, like you say, off-centers of the beaters. Mm-hmm. And uh, go ahead and set it down. I can I can edit that out later. <laughs> oh, sorry. And uh, <laughs> All right, so moving on to uh, Channel 2, the snare. Small system, small rig. What are you doing? Uh, it really depends on the sound of the snare itself. I'm somewhere between a 57 and I-5 and a D2, depending on how it sounds for the night. Nice. Nice. And uh, Anthony ran to get something. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. take his place for a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, my choice, small system, small venue. Again, yeah, you're right. It depends on the sound of the snare, although I pretty much always go with a, an SM57. Um, yeah. I know the short stuff gets bagged on a lot, but you know the 57 and the 58 haven't been industry standards for 40 years for nothing yeah no um, i do tend you, to favor myself the 57 yeah. most of the time it's just sometimes the placement it is a slightly larger mic than the audix variety so sometimes yep. for space sake the d2 yep. so is like, a close enough second i think anthony will probably agree with that but placement on that would be uh he's he's waving something at me it's too dark to see um placement that on that away. would be just peeking over the rim of the snare you know usually looking sort of back at the drummer uh, the head of the mic about an inch over the rim of the drum and tipped down a little bit. Some guys like to aim it right at the worn spot where the drummer hits. Some guys like to angle it off a little bit. Um, I like to kind of see what they're doing. I mean, if it's a pork pie, if it's a deep snare, piccolo snare, metal shell, wood shell, hoops. Like it just there's there's such a voice to the snare that uh, it's almost always worth you know having them hit it a little bit, see how they're going to play, and, and kind of make adjustments to that before I you touch EQ. The other trick that I'll do, uh, Anthony's back, I'll let him talk in a second. Um, the other trick that I'll do is in a small venue, a lot of times you've got more snare than you need before you turn a single mic on. And then you turn on all the mics and you've got snare in your kick mic and you've got snare in your tom mics and you've got it in the vocal mics and the guitar mics and somehow there's a little bit bleeding in on the bass DI. I don't know how that happens, but it does. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is just let the top go unassisted and let it bleed wherever it's going to go. And then uh, I'll take that 57, put it on the bottom head, get uh, a lot of that snare sound, you know, get some some of the personality of the drum, the sizzle from under there. And sometimes I won't even put that uh, in the mains. I'll leave the, the channel unbust, but I will send it through the reverb with the rest of the kit. Yep. So you get the natural snare sound in the room, but then you also get some of that space that you're putting on the kit as a whole to kind of round things out a little bit. Uh, Anth, single snare mic. Um, single snare mic, uh, I, for... For the last two years, I've gone strictly with a i5, um, but this week in particular is kind of a—it's a weird week for me where I'm going with a bunch of mics that I really don't necessarily pick. But I, I've got a shelf full of 57s, and I've got a few D112s, even though I've stolen John's Beta 52 for the last year or so. Is that what that is? Yeah. It, <laughs> well, it's, it's around. Son of a biscuit. <laughs> Keep wanting um, that thing. That's why I fell in love with the D112 again. It's because I've been forced to dig it out. It's sometimes necessity is, you know, the mother uh, of mother uh, of sometimes you necessity not is just a mother, things. really. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've got a D112 on the kick that I'm using now for this this kids camp thing, which has actually turned out pretty well. There've been about 300 kids every day, all this week, um, three days so far. But uh, again, with that that shelf full of 57s, I just pulled out a couple stands threw it on um right now it's it's a pearl uh a loop or i'm sorry steel shell snare that i've got one of those remo o's on to to get out all that ring because no matter how much i tune that sucker it just it won't go away um 
and I've got a really nice crack to it. Like it, it's it's borderlining on something that I would want from a maple shell. Uh, so I, if I had a choice, I would I would try and use two. But this week the fifty seven is really giving me all that I need. I only have two two drum mics because it's it's in a gym setting, so <laughs> overheads aren't an issue. They just they ring out in the parking lot like it's nobody's business. And stop next Tuesday. Right. Yeah. So I mean, by the time the thing's done, we still got some some. 30 second notes going on a hi-hat that I, I still don't understand but uh the 57 is really coming through for me big time like i honestly am surprised at what i've got out of it especially with only a three band eq uh low at 80 high at 12k and a sweepable mid from i think 250 to 5k um and it, it's really it surprised me again like we everybody uses 57 on a snare that's the standard and everything, but yep. you'll find like even the snootiest studio cats with million dollar consoles and the biggest road dogs will still more often than not reach for that old fifty seven for the snare. That's the one application where it's really hard to argue with. Not yeah. that there aren't other good choices, but that that one's just it's so well suited to that application. It, right. And it's it's something that I've come back to. Like I think I'm on my next session I'm gonna try out. Usually I, I just not ignore it, but I've got an I five, so why would I bother? But it's you know, um, going with Carl's technique of getting it off the rim a bit and angling it probably about 20 degrees or so, so you still get some ring out of the snare if you want it, but angled right at the center where the drummer should be hitting. Um, and that, that gets a really nice, thick and still attacky type sound. Yep. And EQ too, kids. Like some of you guys that are just coming into the business, it's, uh, it's apparently not cool anymore to have anything below 1K in your snare sound, but... All of us guys remember going to shows, and you could feel feel the kick and the snare in your chest. Yep, yep. And that's that's something that I miss, and that's something I've been bringing back in my mixing. Yes, and me some, too. That we we talked about that on the last podcast yeah. and a, a blog post where two hundred really brings out some of the 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 kick yep. in the snare, not the kick drum, but but some of the the it beat puts to some it. Meat in the beat, right? Yeah, yeah. like nice you, little chunk, right? All right. So that's uh, three quarters of the show gone, and <laughs> actually, I don't know how much time we're using. We have first rack Tom. Haven't yeah. Yeah, well, let's just do Tom's as a group quick and move on. <laughs> we are halfway done with the show now, and we're still on channel two. <laughs> oh, I suppose you'd like me to start this. Huh? Okay, yeah. Let's that's, yeah. Do, okay. Yep, rack Tom's. Okay, all right. Go. Yeah, pretty much uh, going to the D twos like all the time now, just because work with a lot of people that have really tight kits, and there's no room for anything else. Love a four twenty one though. Yeah. Well, everybody. Yeah, I mean, their 421s are killer. I'd like to grab a couple. Think about getting a kit built by one of our, our friends, our lighting guy, Steve, with just two toms and two 421s on those toms, where if if you really want to hear the sound of the tom, what's the one thing I've, I've found is a downfall about the, the Audix D-Series is that they sound like the Audix D-Series. And if that's what you're going for in a live setting, that's great. But it's a rock sound, yeah. right? Yep. It's you get a, a lot of attack, but you don't get a lot of ring out of it unless you angle them straight down off the head, mm -hmm. um, like right towards the rim. Yeah, uh, which is actually what I'm doing most of the time, unless it's right. really yeah. ringy. And, and I got some great sounds out of that with a that that same Gretsch Renown Maple Kit. It it sounds really good, and you get enough ring from the room mics and the overheads to to compensate for that. But if I mean, if I had a choice. I I definitely go four twenty ones if I've got a drummer that's capable of handling four twenty ones. Yep, yeah. and a kit, and the and the, if the project will handle it. Right. Um, right. I would hardly ever reach for them on a stage, although I have. I mean, when they're uh -huh. around, I'll yeah, baby, put them. They to use. sound killer on floors. My pick. Yeah. Oh yeah, my pick for a long time has been uh, the um, Audio Technica Pro thirty five X. I think it is. Yeah, I just call them the thirty fives. Little clip-on gooseneck condenser, tiny mic, tiny. As long as yeah. nobody beats the crap out of it. Right. Well, that's the reason why I don't found. like those. Yeah, they they unless me. your drummer's doing rim shots on the upper edge. Um, yeah. They don't get hit by, hit by drummers too much. What happens is, on a set change, I'll hang them on the kickstand, and somebody will tromp on them, like tromp on the cable, yank it, they wind up on the floor, they get trodden upon. Um, and it's, it's the feet in the changeovers that kill them. But uh, the cool thing about a condenser, even a tiny one, is... Um, it's more of an omni pickup, pick up, a wider pickup pattern on those. So uh, in a small venue, you can get away without overheads because you're getting lots of nice cymbal bleed in there. A lot of times that's enough. And uh, they really get a big, round sound. And the thing about those, you know, I've heard other similar style mics, and like we can talk about like the Sennheisers and the all the different clip-on style mics, but these little guys just get such a nice, big, round sound that uh, I have a hard time reaching for anything else when I've got those on hand. 
And there's there's not like I like them on. I used them when I borrowed your your mic box for a while. I used them on saxophones. Oh, they're fantastic! Yeah, oh my oh, yeah. god, I love them on sax. Gorgeous oh god, I've actually got the wireless versions for when I. Anytime I'm dealing with brass, it's like, hey, what am I else that's made for you? We've got <laughs> yeah, we've got a. a Unbelievable saxophone player at the church. He's played with Buffalo Hill Harmonic. He's played with Tower of Power when they come into town. He's he's a beast, and he's an accountant during the day. And he's not Jewish. <laughs> ah, three channels. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, he's he is. I there are very few saxophone players that I'd rather have playing than this guy. He just he plays all three. He plays soprano, alto, tenor. Like his soprano is beautiful. Like it. Honestly, I think it puts Kenny G to shame because it's not just all about him. Like he knows when to play, knows when not to play. To in. But uh, he, uh, he's <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a fan- fantastic player. Actually, when I when I took that mic box, I ended up switching back. I had AKG C four nineteens for a while, and they were. They're small condenser yeah, goose. What four seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen, or something like that? That series. Uh, I don't remember if they were eighteen or nine. They were eighteen or nineteens for sure, but they look like they were attached, like permanently attached to what looked like um, potato chip clip. Oh yeah, yeah. Bag thing. I've seen those on the Audix, some Audix mics. Yeah, I've I've got, I've got them around really? somewhere. Like I I don't I might have used the actual microphone to clip a bag of pretzels. But oh yeah, that clippies thing, it, and yeah. they've got like gummy edges on them. That's okay. They, like they didn't sound terrible, but for my setting every week, like they're the drums are in a cage and a condenser in a cage. Um, yeah. Does on toms does not do nice things. They just it sounds like mud. Doesn't matter what you do to it. EQ wise, if you if you over EQ it, it, just it sounds like hitting a paper bag. Really. Yep. There's it. It was just real rough to try and get like unless you're flying everything perfect at sound check, it's not. It wasn't something that I would go to at all. Right. Yeah, a little bit of a recording night with John's mics. I never really used to care for them originally, but then we tried a couple different preamps with them, and then that really actually brought those out quite a bit more. Yeah, I haven't really kept track of that. I I do like them better on some boards than not. I actually think you didn't like them on my Allen. Yeah, which oh. we both own Allens. Right. I've been using them for years, but um, then tried them on the Personas, I think it was, one night or a Soundcraft, and then I was like, oh. Yeah, I, I like them better on my Soundcraft than on my Allen. I don't mind them on the Allen, though. Yeah. Um, there, there's, a, there's a guy that I know that's got, um, at the chapel, he's got, he uses the Sennheiser, I think they're 602s or 604, whatever the, 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 the baseline Sennheiser clip-on microphones that... If you use them for more than two weeks, the clip-on part of them breaks, and you got to pay more money for it. Um, he runs it through EAW KF 740s up top and a bunch of dual 18s on the bottom through a Yamaha PM1D with ungodly amounts of preamps and compression on them, and they they really sound good. But but that's work, right? Yeah. If that's, I mean, if you're willing to invest the hundreds of that, well, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, <laughs> yeah, into that setup. And you want to skimp out on the mics? Yeah, absolutely. Go go with the the cheapy sense. Yeah, I plug my ATs in, and they sound good. Like I don't even EQ them that much, unless yeah. there's like a real boom in the room or something. Yeah. Um, and this is I'm going to segue into overheads. Um, uh, this is really kind of the key to Tom sounds. I feel like, and actually for the sound of the whole kit. Yeah. Um, with a condenser overhead, you know, I'll I'll line check the toms first, but then I'll pull the faders down, check the overheads, and then have them get back on the toms and just fill in then just, yeah, the we'll, body of the drum with the close mic and get the crack and the attack off the, the overheads. And uh, my pick for overheads, um, I really like an SM81 in yep. a lot of applications. If there's a lot of room, if I'm on a big stage, indoors or out, um, I like the AKG 430s a ton. Yeah. Um, I like 81s. He's close cursing me right now. But. I like 81s <laughs> close together, XY, and I like my 430s AB, like far apart. Yep. yep. And some guys have criticized me, like, oh, why don't you have a hi-hat mic? Why don't you have a ride mic? I'm like, don't need it. <laughs> I have a 430 four feet over the hi-hat. There's another one four feet over the ride, and I'm hearing everything. Like, right. Turn them up. They're yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, um, and when I get on a really nice stage, C3000s come out of the box and play nice. <laughs> yep. And my other trick, uh, that's big stage. Small stage, I'll actually use an SM57 if I if I need an overhead. If I'm right. not getting yeah, enough. Yeah, if you're in a really dead room that's kind of or if you're in a really one. if you're in a really live room that's that's where I started doing it was like man I yeah. I want to hear more cymbals but I don't want to park a, a pencil mic over the drummer cuz it's just going to, you know, I'm going to start bleed. picking up guitar amp and monitor bleed <laughs> yeah. and all kinds of stuff. So you put a dynamic mic up there. And uh, it sort of acts as a filter. Like, it sort of expands yeah. itself. 
Right. Um, you get those cymbal hits. You get a little bit of the crack off the toms. You get some snare in there. And unless you do that subtle mixing between the close mics and the distance mic, uh, notice I said mic. I mean, we're yeah. talking small situations. Stereo yeah. would be a loss. <laughs> like it yeah. were, It's not yeah. worth burning the input or setting up another stand, especially if the drummer's jammed in a corner of a stage that's eight feet wide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't don't uh, turn down a dynamic mic for an overhead. Uh, don't overlook that because 57 is a really versatile mic. You can do just a ton of stuff with that thing, um, especially distance miking. Something to consider. Yeah, actually, it's, for uh, some like just really quick live recordings, I've just thrown 57s on, up on poles to capture an overall, and then like maybe flavored in just a little bit more vocal off a of bus. Yep. Yeah, they're they're terrific room mics for recording. I've done a ton of recording, field recording of bands with uh, a pair of 57s in the back. Uh, put throw that on a four track and then take two stereo, two uh, you know a stereo bus from the board and you can make some really nice moments happen with that playing it back. All right, uh, Gordon, overheads. I think we just covered overheads, didn't we? Did we, did we get it all in there? I think um, we did. Although we didn't work in Anthony's Judaism. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I think we did kind of skip over the floor top. Uh, no, Far wait, well, hold on. They were there when I got there, so it's okay. <laughs> I didn't have to pay for them. No, when when I showed up, we had uh, the four thirties that John has now. I actually we traded. Mm -hmm. um, I took two of his SM eighty ones, which in we've talked about it before. The I've got a drum ISO booth with a plexiglass and the brown board and the brown board top and all that kind of stuff. The four thirties weren't doing it for me. There was too much bleed off of. The walls off of the the top plexiglass portion. I was getting a lot of. They're a real air mic. They were getting all the really? reflections. Yeah, it's and that's not a bad thing. Like if you've got an open kit, you get you get a lot of nice room sound, a lot of whole kit sound. But for what I was going for, like I've got on the kit for toms, I've got um, the Audix D2 and the D4 on the floor. But for overheads, I really just wanted the cymbals. I didn't want a whole lot of whole kit sound. Um, I've worked it out to the point where. I, I'd like to keep every mic isolated as much as I can because I don't trust the engineer that I have when the services are going on. Um, and to clarify, I, the reason I don't mix while the service is going on is because I'm playing guitar and, and stage managing and directing the band. Um, so I'll either play guitar or bass depending on the week, and I don't have... I'll, I'll sound check um, because the guy's lazy and doesn't get there early, but... Once I get in there, the mix changes, whether I'm adding bass or guitar and stuff. So the SM81s added a nice, you know, split one in between the edge of the ride symbol and the edge of the, the crash over the, if you're sitting at the kit, the right side of the kit, if you're looking at the left side. Um, and on the other side, the the other crash over the snare and the hi-hat. Um, and at whatever is not, you're not getting hi-hat wise, usually comes through real hot in the snare mic. Mm -hmm. um, but for recording the things that I got when I got there, which were free to me because I'm a Jew, five channels, um, were sure KSM 44s, which are large diaphragm condensers. They're switchable pattern. You can go figure eight cardio. Oh, he or, went there. Cardioid <laughs> or Omni, um, variable roll off, uh, flat one sixty or 80. And there's a 15 decibel pad on them. Um, and that's, if I've got less than, what I would like on the Tom mics, those really come through, especially if, if the drummer knows how to hit his cymbals and doesn't just, just beat them like, like a bad stepchild, really. Um, those come through really nice, and that's what I use for recording, too. It gets a nice full, uh, full kit sound if they're placed correctly. Um, what, I, what I've started doing a lot is not laying them flat, but angling them just a touch. Yeah. Um, so they're above the hi-hat angled in about 25 to 30 degrees and then above the ride angled in about 25 to 30 degrees. And that gets a really nice, if you split them, you hard pan them or even 75% pan them. Um, the, the whole kit sounds really nice just through them. So yeah. much for hurrying. Yeah, just to add in on another overhead choice, then uh, Road K2s with a fully variable polar pattern are nice to play with if you like the tube kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, tubes, tubes are great on everything. We've talked yeah. in the past, too, and this is more of a recording thing, but it, it can work out live. If you're looking for a real kit sound, jazz sound, uh, just a kick in an overhead can get you pretty far. Yeah, if you I have actually like, did uh, recording, what was it, two years ago now out in Cleveland last minute, and it was, a, I think, a D4 on the kick drum and two C3000s over top, and came out great. It sounds great. You hear the whole kit. It's a nice blended sound. You don't get that isolation. You don't you know get the gated tom, gated everything sound. 
you hear the kit yep. as people would hear the kit, which is a cool way to go sometimes. I think people forget that a kit can sound like that. All right, moving on. Uh, this one should be quick. Bass. Um, oh, come on now. You're skipping over the floor tom still. <laughs> we cover toms. Well, the floor tom's a little special, though. Okay, D4. Moving yeah, on. D4 and D112. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'll actually use my... Uh, oh, yeah, RE20. Yeah. All right. Okay, bass, so bass. Uh, uh, radial DI, thanks to John, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, well, yeah. Well, was using whirlwinds and stuff and then uh, discovered the radial JDI, yeah. and, well, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah we use, the, uh, use a nice DI. Um, I like, uh, it actually doesn't matter what brand it is. Uh, see if you can dig around and find out what transformer's inside. If it's from Jensen, if it's yeah, from Whirlwind, one. if it's from Hammond. And there's one German company that's slipping my mind right now. That makes transformers Lundahl. They're yes. good one. Yeah. So if it's yeah, isn't there? Is that the company that their motto is like just copper varnish and paper the way Some, God intended or something? Something like that. Like that that yeah. might be that company. <laughs> um, so yeah, look at the transformers. What's key in there? Because if, you, if you've ever opened a passive DI, that's all it is. There's a, an in jack, a through jack, a little transformer, ground left switch, and an XLR jack on the other side. That's all it is. Yep. We'll uh, we'll have a whole we'll have a lesson on DIs at some point, but. It's pretty common just to DI the bass, especially in a small venue. If a guy's playing a cab of any kind of size, that's blending into the room sound. Um, but if you do go DI and mic, which some people do, I've used a D112 yeah. with a lows rolled off. Um, used a 57 like a guitar mic. You know, if I'm looking at a fridge where I've got a bunch of eight inch cones or ten inch cones, don't hate on the SVT. Oh no, 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 no. beautiful. But yeah, you'll use your, you use, you know, one input for the boom, another one for the definition. If you got a player who's just thumping away, you can get away with just using a, a DI, but if you got a player, jazz player, or you know somebody who's going up the neck, somebody who's got like a real technical yeah. bass that's got a nice string sound and attack sound, you want to mic one of those speakers and, yep. and get some and of that. A lot of that stuff, I mean, if you've got a bass player that actually knows what he's doing, chances are he's got his own DI or his own preamp. Like, there's... There's some gorgeous stuff. I when I play out, um, Carl told me to get actually when I didn't know what I was doing before I, I started tanning some more. Um, I bought a what is it a, a Dunlop MXR 180 or, or something like that M80. I'm sorry, um, and it it really is. It's a gorgeous sounding preamp. Um, honestly, if if you're getting into bigger stuff, it couldn't hurt to have. A nice preamp around for the bass because if you got somebody showing up, the the J forty eight sounds fantastic. The, my only gripe with it is you're getting exactly the sound of the bass. If the bass player wants to blend in some overdrive, right? Um, the M eighty is fantastic. The overdrive circuit in it sounds pretty nice. Like it's not it's not overpowering unless you really want it to be. It's got a nice color switch. It's phantom powered, which is killer. Yep. Um, the Aguilar Tone Hammer is also really nice for that. Um, and what pretty much everybody else uses is the Sans Amp Bass DI, yep. which I wasn't a huge fan of because it's it's got on and off mode. There's no, like, you can blend in and it's a solid sound all the way through. Um, but, like, the rack mount version of it is, is gorgeous. It just, it, it seems to come alive a bit more than the mm -hmm. pedal. Um but if, if it's if you're working with a band consistently, um, it, it doesn't hurt to have that kind of stuff around. Like have the MXR, the the Sans Amp DI, or uh, the Aguilar. I think there's another bass called EB, EBM that makes a fantastic, very tone shapeable. Um, it'll cover your slap bass players, your regular thumb bass players, your finger players, your pick players, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't let them know that there's knobs on it, they won't screw with it. <laughs> that's that's the key. Pull them off and hide them. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot no, of bases are uh, fairly nice. They've got no, that, direct outputs off the amp. They seem to have gotten a little intelligent with that factor, which well, does, as long they as they're actually used. They and, don't crap out. Yeah, exactly. Thing, that, <laughs> Ampeg amps, I love them, but yeah. the, the XLR outs on them, the line outs on them, fart out. That's, so not, it's that's like not where common, the money is in the SVTs. That's, yeah, yeah. that's the thing. It's like, a common yeah. common issue, though, with those. And uh, signal chain-wise, I mean, I think this gets overlooked a lot, but where you insert the DI makes a lot of difference. Yes. Um, you got to talk to a bass player. You might even want to hear him play a little bit. Like, you know, does he have a very sculpted sound coming out of the amp, and you want to just back it up with a little thump? You take it right after the instrument and then let him do what he's going to do with his signal. If you're in a large venue and you want that sculpted sound, you take a line out of the amp and, you know, an XLR out and go back or go through a DI through an XLR. Yeah. If he's got pedals, Let's which a lot of bass players do now, um, any instrument can be played as a lead instrument. So if you've yeah. got a guy who's playing lead, you, you need to capture his whole sound or figure out how to blend it into the room. Victor right Wooten. Yeah. 
yeah. Marcus Miller. All like the Ow. guys that know. Yeah, right. The guys that know what they're doing. It like if you can spare it, if you got room on your input list, um, it sometimes if you can't run everything, if you can run through a DI and run them through just a mic, like run them through fifty seven, just roll off the bottom end, um, and just get that nice that slap sound. That's not going to kill you. Yep. And then on your yep. DI, roll off the top end. So then you got a fat yeah. channel and a skinny channel. You can play them off each other. Right. You don't because you don't need all of the top end right. in a in a, right. in a verse a or anything like that. All right. Now, this next one could potentially be a hornet's nest and send us into extra innings. So, oh boy, we're gonna go, left, we're gonna talk guitars. We left weapons inside. So we're gonna do it. Be, this should be simple. We're gonna do it quick. <laughs> this is gonna be a skirmish, <laughs> not a battle. <laughs> This this one ought to be one of those like word associate like a Rorschach test like the word association like okay guitars go <laughs> we're not uh. we're not going to talk about studios and, and situations and things oh. we're gonna we're gonna like what's your gut reaction to put on a guitar amp gut reaction if I've got absolutely no channels left to my name it's pretty much just the fifty seven generally fifty seven six oh nine or if I had the money four twenty ones word mm. um. I would Although go, Anthony's also said i5. I haven't tried it. I yet. haven't I didn't really like the i5. No. I get, like unless it's really piercing. What what I found about the i5 is that it'll it'll level out a channel a little bit. There's a little bit more uh, low mids to it it seems at least. Okay. With guitar cabs. So with So if it's a little bit thin maybe it'd work but Right. Yeah, like I found it it works great on jazz guitar type stuff. You got okay. a big fat uh, jazz box, you know, like five inch thick jazz box. It looks like an acoustic guitar, but it's an electric. Mm-hmm. Um, the i5. Let's, really... let's not go all the way down this road, though. This is easily two more shows. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> what's, what's, stop playing what's your instruments before this? <laughs> it's you, one minute to sound check. What do you grab to put on the cab? Six oh nine. Beautiful. Every time. Same thing. Fifty seven six oh nine. That's that's our choice for any size venue. And uh, my technique is to use them both. I'll put the six oh nine flat on. 70, or, uh, the 57 at an angle yep. that gives you a fat channel and a skinny channel. And when you don't have time, when you're on a gig by yourself to run to the stage and back, I mean, moving a guitar mic around is, is an exact science. Guys will yeah. mark their yep. cabs, like put it I've right got, here. I've like, got tape marks around where I want my 57, where I want my 609, different colored spike tapes and everything. Yep. Yeah, now if you don't have channels for both, which would you grab? I mean, I listen to the guitar first. you got to listen to the sound. Yeah. Um, if it's a, a skinny sound, needs fattening yeah. up, I go with the 609. If it's a fat sound and I want to make sure I get the top, I'll go with the 57. What about maybe angling the 57, moving it back? Maybe two, three inches off the off the grill cloth. Could do, although I I wouldn't do that live so much because yeah. I'm worried about bleed. I want to keep the gain down, um, so I'm not getting monitor bleed, drum bleed, um, and then yeah, I mean, if it's if it's an all around like if it's just an awesome guitar tone, I'll probably go with the six oh nine. It just seems like there's more life and sparkle in there yeah. across the board, like from top to bottom. The six oh nine is probably the number it, one. Choice. It seems like there's more to work with too, yeah. like which, fif- which is saying something. Like to unseat the fifty seven, like that's the other thing that fifty sevens. No matter how big, dog, and snooty you are, you got a fifty seven for your guitars. Yeah. Slash uses live because um, I used to look like Slash and I love Slash. Uh, on his live cabinets, he uses a fifty seven. And a KSM three thirteen, I think. Whatever the sure sure ribbon mic is, that's black and red. Um, oh, he yeah. uses yeah. that. And I don't that, think I'll ever be doing it. ribbons on stage, but uh, you can. <laughs> they're, they're, they're nice. Roy- that's the problem. They're nice. Roy- <laughs> Royer's done some awesome stuff. Royer's got some awesome stage worthy. Yeah, they can yeah. handle it. Which I'm looking at because they're they're cheaper too because they oh, they right. just yeah Royer they, and cheap usually aren't in the same. Size. Right. Well, I'm mean, cheap compared to a normal Royer <laughs> like the. Yeah. And we th- it right, yeah, we're covering. Yeah, there we go. We got the Jew in on that. Um, they've got a, a. It's. I mean, it's when you look at it in a magazine, it doesn't look too big, but you see a guy holding it. It's. I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen the hand gestures mm, over your like face. That's an edit. Video podcast. Uh, <laughs> it's. I mean, it. It. It's. It's a decent sized mic. Like it. You know, you can wrap your hand around it, but not too much, depending on your hand size. And you you throw that in front, and it's I mean I I love the way ribbon mics sound on pretty much anything. Yeah, got a little bit of a dark. They hand really hand. they add a different aspect than what uh, yeah. large diaphragm condensers and. Uh, I love them for room mics in the studio. But yeah, we're also yeah. not going there. All right, yeah. let's jump to vocals because that's going to take a minute, and then we're going to go to some oddball choices. Uh, uh, Gordon vocals, vocals. Uh, if they can stay on the mic, I generally go with something hypercardioid. D thirty seven hundreds happen to be my choice. 
Uh, if, Which is a shame because they're awesome and they don't make them. Right. Although yeah. they, they are remaking its sister, Mike, the 3800. I think it was just a slight difference in polar pattern from what I remember. Is no, that was... like them remaking the Yamaha NS10s? No, because they actually <laughs> did make the 3800. <laughs> They've just basically updated the look a little bit. It looks more okay. like the wireless series now. Oh, okay. Nice. That's and, not too uh, bad. I haven't messed around with those yet. But... And then, uh, like, if I know... People are a big fan of the 58. I like a little bit more high-end for intelligibility purpose because usually I'm outside or in a really humid bar and I'm fat and I sweat and I like to hear high-end. So, <laughs> I don't know how that ties together, but that's okay. That's working. Go with it. Hey, you know. There's a lot of humidity that comes off of Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's been a while since you worked with him. <laughs> that's very true. If anybody needs a swamp cooler, I may do you, qualify. Do you take readings when you're in the room or out of it when for humidity? Uh, yeah, generally I just put it under my armpit and squeeze. Huh? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I actually we've lost a lot of good mics that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't put mics there. Anyway, but uh, the Rode M1 to seems to be off. a very worthy competitor to it. It doesn't have the 250 wonkiness that the 58 does, but it does have a fair amount of wonkiness at 500, so beware of that. But the top end is definitely clear. Um, for live mics in particular, uh, it, it depends on the singer. If they're right on something... Um, I've got some Audix stuff, the OM6 and the OM7. Yeah, I do have the OM2s for, like, training purposes. They they right. are a little bit too tight. You do really, yeah. really, you, you really have to need stay to be on, on top of those. There's, there's a reason that Dave Ratt uses them with Anthony Keyless. Like, he cups the mic like it's it's his job. Yeah, there's, some there's people no, love that. There's no air coming out of the bottom of that diaphragm at all. Um, and it still sounds good. You can still hear his voice through it. Anthony Keyless doesn't have a very boomy voice at all, which is... Which is an issue for me. Like a lot of people yeah, that if I you cup a mic, you get that that mid kicking in there. And right, yeah. he makes it work. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, he he also owns millions of dollars worth of stuff, and he's way out of our league. But we like to hang out with you. Uh, <laughs> so side, you're side note. Um, but uh, for for other singers, I I know Carl likes them a lot. I like the SM. Or I'm sorry, the Beta 57 A's. Yeah, actually, on background uh, singers especially. Yeah, there's a keyboard player that I've been working with in the local band that has one of those, and it's like, wow. I really like that. And uh, what I was against for such a long time, I really hated almost everything from the Shure SM line, but then I sold John's mic box again, and I got <laughs> the, the SM86s. And mm-hmm. those, yeah, it, they, I'm, I'm going to preach on that in a minute. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've got the wireless version of that, which is pretty nice. Right. Yeah. But but even for wired stuff, like I've got a very boomy voice when I sing. Um, what, I, what I would prefer to have in everything is a Sennheiser E945. Please, no 835s. No 835s. We'll get no. to that, too. <laughs> the 865 is okay for some stuff, but the 900 series, I'm not a big fan of 935s, but the 945 and 965, um, it's it's hard to make something sound bad on that. Like, I've got, my boss is one of the vocalists, she'll lead vocalist, actually, um, and off of a 965, I had her sit down, literally took the EQ out of the circuit, because that's one of three nice things on the desk that i have um <laughs> you can you, you can disengage the eq circuit what's the second thing uh turns on and the third <laughs> thing is that it's not a behringer right yeah that's that's really yeah We're that's, all you on the X32 that's, that's all we get the demo. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about it you can disengage the eq circuit there's 16 mix outs that i use to drive avioms and stuff but just straight up um i set her she's She's a soprano that wants to be a second alto real bad, um, and she won't acknowledge it because she's getting up there in years, but uh, she sounded fantastic, just flat. Like, they started screwing around with EQ, and I kept just disengaging the circuit. I actually went in the desk and pulled pulled the button so they can't actually... You can, quote, enable the EQ circuit, but it, it does nothing. Um, and it, she sounded great on it and she's like, I really want to get one of these. And what it came down to, she's like, Oh, it cost $700. I'm, uh, uh, what, what else do we have the before Neumann Carl KS takes those back? I believe it is. I actually, you know what? I, I haven't actually heard one. I like, Nora Jones, but I like the, the 965 better than the KSM yeah. or K KMS 104 and 105. It is switchable. So you can switch from cardioid to hyper, but it just, it seems smoother. It it had um, almost a more studio quality to a live vocal than the Neumann did. Maybe it's just because I always used the right pre's or my board sucks and all that garbage, <laughs> but I really like the 965 a lot. All right, so to wrap up, I'm going to put my two cents in. Now, everybody else is going to cringe, but I go with the SM58. It hasn't been 
on stage for what close to 50 years now for no reason. Everybody just had a heart attack, so we're going to take a minute. Right, and everybody needs a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, well, but for what I do, we talked about this actually on about the third podcast. Now, I come from a construction background. <laughs> sometimes you just the stage is broken, you need to drive some nails, and your Stanley 16-ounce framing hammer is in the truck. Uh, you can drive some nails with that sucker, put it on By the way, a lifetime and... warranty on the road, so you could probably use it as a hammer, too, but it's nicer as a mic. But no, it's uh, the reason I use it is, one, it's basically a disposable mic. They're $89. The bass player in a black metal band yeah, can knock it over like... and, and jump up and down on it, and it'll still pass signal. Uh, and it's also a common denominator. I mean, yeah, it's got some stuff wrong with it. It's you know, It's got a little hump. Uh, it doesn't have a ton of definition in the upper end, but if you've got to park a mic on stage for a festival in a tent all day, you could do worse. Uh, my other choice is uh, when I was upgrading mics a little bit ago, I was like, all right, you know, I'm standing at the counter asking the guy, like, ah, what do I want? Bait 87A, 87C, reaches behind him and, like, like a sword draws from the counter behind him. It was, try one of these. Hands me an SM86. I tried it. I bought two more. Uh, those are my classy mics. And uh, the only thing about them is they're, uh, I forget if they're super or hypercardioid, but um, the deal with that pickup pattern is you have to move your wedges off to the side a little bit when you're going to use them because there's, it does pick up directly off axis so if, if the back of the mic is pointed at the wedges oh boy are you in trouble uh and i only learned that just recently so i i actually pull those out have historically pulled them out less than uh than, feedback issues you got or oh yeah or? ridiculous feedback oh. issues and i just figured it was like oh well i'm in a tent that's why but no it was because my wedges were right behind them yeah, i can't honestly remember if i've used those in a tent although i believe i did use them in that concrete bunker i'll, I'll pull them out for a female vocalist yeah. in a blues band um no, yeah. You know, for somebody who's not going to swing it by the cord or tromp yeah. on it. Granted, you know, so. might also might be a little bit more resistant to the feedback because it's wireless, so it's probably got a little less high end. And Could do. Yeah, and that's the other thing about a 58 is the wireless versions of them. And even the wireless versions of the knockoffs, um, a 58 on a wireless platform does not work. It's a feedback nightmare. And I think that just <laughs> has to do something with the, the structure of the handle. Like a regular 58's got a nice, heavy, solid zinc handle. Something like there's a cavity behind it in a, a wireless mic and it's i don't know it resonates it's not that's i mean that's actually what we use on sunday mornings for the preacher mic mm-hmm. is sm58 which is nice because he, he'll walk around up front in between the wedges and the mains um and it doesn't come out so bad like i've had to do a, a lot of work yeah like to, oh, to it's really work. get in <laughs> what like to to sound like what he sounds like and all that stuff but um since I've got it dialed in and, you know, like on the drive rack, kill the sub channel so I don't get all that everything under 100 hertz just yeah. making the room like an ocean, really. Yep. Uh, all right. So to wrap up vocal mics, and then the last thing I like is uh, Sennheiser 945. I've got them wireless at work, six of those flying every week. I love them to bits. Nobody sounds bad on those. Most sound really good on them. Uh, and the, the last thing I'll say about vocal mics is I, I keep forgetting to look at the Sennheiser website. Somebody is out there in the world telling female vocalists that that's the mic for them. I don't know how many times I've run into a, a female singer in a rocker, blues, or a country band. Oh, I brought my own mic. Oh, cool. What'd you bring? I have a Sennheiser. Oh, let me guess. It's an 835. Yeah, how'd you know? Like, ugh. Uh, the yeah. thing about that mic is it has a very pronounced hump. Yeah, in a wrong two, spot. Right around yep. 250. And most of these girls, let's face it, are not sopranos. They're altos. Firmly altos. <laughs> they're crooning away on, you know, blues songs. And, you know, they're singing, trying to sing like Melissa Etheridge. And it's it's work, making them work on stage. Especially after a couple drinks, it seems like the range just drops an octave or two. Yeah, it's stick away from the tequila. So it's, a, it's a lot of that. And they're yeah. just, it, it would be a great mic for a soprano. No problem. It, yeah. it would warm up a soprano, make them less. Knock off a little top end, knock get them to mix off in. So they're not screechy. It gives them a nice warmth and, and bottom that wouldn't normally be there on a different mic. But boy, honey, if you're an alto, put that puppy down. Yes. Get a 45, get a 945. Get anything, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take the fifty-eight, please. Right, a, right. Like Fifty-five beta dime with a quarter-inch end on it. I'll make it work. Honey. Right, right. Sing on anything but that. Well, uh, so a- anything maybe short of Mister Microphone. All right, so we've got <laughs> or the the digital reference Radio Shack, whatever they are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, high high Z quarter-inch mic, whatever yeah. USB mic from your computer. I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right. Blue, um, blue makes a nice blue icicle. <laughs> yeah. The, All right, so we got about right ten minutes of the show left. What I want to do now, now that we've covered the major items, is uh, get into some of the oddball stuff that you wind up seeing on festival stages, particularly at like international, you know, world music type stages. Uh, 
Gordon, I'm you, a, you've I, got a banjo. He just showed up. He doesn't have a pickup. What do you put on him? Boy, that was actually kind of scary because I just ran into that and it kind of. You, you put him stuff, on the backstage, is what you do. <laughs> you put him in a, uh, we're going to put the band's van as an ISO booth. <laughs> yeah, get, get yeah. him a pair of headphones. It, it, it turned out to be a '57, and I' not sure if that was necessarily the right choice, right. but I think it was also playing technique. Because banjo uh, players <laughs> invariably also need a ton in the wedges. Yeah, so can't absolutely. park because they can't hear nothing. Yeah, you can't yeah, park a condenser yeah. in front of it a lot of times. No, that and sometimes you just don't want to. There was that, that festival that, that me and Gordon mixed a couple weeks ago with our friend Blake. Um, there was a band last year that we had an issue with that brought their own. They brought two microphones that were both Omni, and on a stage that was... 8 by 16 all concrete pad outside um night, nightmare does not nightmare doesn't begin to describe what we dealt with which also as far as bringing your own mics generally not a problem but please don't tell us 2 minutes before go time yeah like let we us like know. to ring out the monitor so as we don't look like schmucks <gasps> yeah. right so this year the same guy showed up um gordon had just left to do another gig so the first band of the day that i had mixed solo sounded like nuts Sorry again, Anthony. Yeah. Um, All right, moving on. But they it's, like for there's like eight minutes left. For, 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 <laughs> for the banjo, I ended up just sticking a bunch of those D thirty seven hundreds or whatever the oh, AKG yeah. ones were on there. There you go. And yep. they're like, eh, yeah, we'll just we'll lean into stuff, and leaning into stuff was still three feet away from yeah everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the, the only reason why I wouldn't pull one of those is because at least. The banjo players I've encountered generally tend to like move around a little bit and kind of get swaying and stomping their feet. Yep. So. Right. Well, these guys sounded bad last year, so I didn't want to make yeah. a change. Although a pace. good bluegrass band can play on one mic. You park a two inch yes. condenser in front of them yep. and they'll mix themselves. They'll step up to solo, they'll step back and blend in, sing on the same mic, and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, John actually threw me in on an accordion festival last year and uh just like, huh, this ought to be interesting and I ended up sticking two C three thousands out front and I think John, you were, what, individually miking them with 57s or Actually, something yeah, like that before? Let's, let's skip to accordions real quick. If you're going to close mic, if you have an accordion as a part of a rock band, it's a loud stage, you can't you can't do the wide area thing. Um, accordions have highs coming out of one side and lows coming out of another, so you really need to double mic them to get the full effect. Otherwise, all you hear is, is the key sound, and you miss the, the cording that they're doing. Yep. So, yeah, I would do 609 on the bottom sound and a 57 on the top sound, and that was... I, yeah, I can't remember. Did you actually end up trying the 430s on the high end or just scrap that idea? Um, I think we had talked about it, but... I, I didn't have them at the time. Or I okay. might have had one. Um, okay. I think I used that for somebody who had like a little concertina, like a squeeze box. Yeah, yeah. It didn't have any bass, any bass sound to it. Um, so that's accordions real quick. I got another one for you. Something that takes two mics. Uh, Jimbe. Which I actually have not encountered one, I don't believe. That's another one that, where... Is that, you, that's the... Not to sound like a moron here for anybody that does play that to Jimbe. But He's a little that, white. Yeah, you know, sorry. But that is the drum that's kind of wide at the top and gets Va- and yeah. widens out again. Yeah, vase yep. shaped. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you Our, gotta, hourglass figure. you got to yeah, mic the top head to get the smack, back. and you right. got to mic the bottom. Because yeah. when they hit it with their heel, it makes a gorgeous right. low note. You know, yeah, so work the kind subs. of basically just like a conga, just tuned a bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I generally well, is, is it Jimbe generally it? played with sticks and Kungas played with hands? Um, it, they can go hands. either way. All right. And I'm uh, not sure I've exactly what the difference is. Some drummer, Steve, can tell us when we, yeah, if we yeah. ever get him on. But, I, uh, I do plan on doing a drum episode, though, so you drummers, uh, stick tight. Nice. Yeah, generally I'd stick with a variety of condenser, provided I had any left. I've usually got C1000s that I bought years ago that generally get pulled out for things like that, you know, occasionally on brass stuff, you know, just kind of a utility condenser mic to have around i'd put that on the top and probably a d2 or d4 depending on how low the drum went on the bottom all right cool let's go back into the strings upright bass guy doesn't have a pickup Ooh, fun times and also very challenging if you have a large audience to try and get that out to mm-hmm. uh re20 or 320 would be kind of a nice thing to have i don't own one so it'd end up probably being a d112 where do you put it uh i haven't actually ever had to but if you can get away with a few inches away and like on the f hole or on the strings uh it probably depends if it's plucked or bowed yeah yeah definitely on that if bowed i think i would probably go a little bit higher up towards the neck yeah yeah and if he's if he's popping but and thing, slapping yeah, right and basically right go to the other yeah what, what i've had a lot of luck with is i've got a bear dynamic ea a34 i think use that on stage yeah oh wow. uh, yeah. um it, yeah, well if it's in a string setting system. yeah um and that about usually it'll go in between plucking and, and bowing. So I'll put it about 
are three inches off of the strings, maybe maybe six if I can get away with it, halfway in between the strings and the F hole on the, the higher register. Right. And my trick is... Now, uh, if that's in a rock kind of a setting, how would you do that? Because I always This, this is my trick, few, and I have run into to cello and upright bass players in a rock band. Um, you take an SM57, the old standby, you grab the cord, you run it back up along the body of the mic and loop it, loop it down, and then you have to keep a piece of foam in your mic right. box. You need... Uh, yeah, the cello that stuff would work out rip well. it out of the yeah, even foam. if you have to rip foam out of your mic box, but get a, a piece of that light gray foam, that lightweight stuff, not dense. Uh, you want it to have just a real nice yeah, like light the egg touch. crate kind of stuff. Um, egg crate's a little s- too it smushy stuff? and it'll slip. Uh, I like the okay. sort of I guess it's medium density gray foam, but a lot of okay. stuff comes packed in this stuff. And yeah. I like a solid chunk of it. I don't like it to be egg yeah, crated. Yeah, the solid's bad, but <laughs> but you you double the cord back up the mic, you wrap it around. If it's thin foam, two, three, four times. If it's thick foam, once. And you just jam that sucker right in the bridge of the instrument. You get a ton of resonance. You get a ton of string sound. It doesn't matter if they pluck or they bow. It sounds gorgeous. And it's a dynamic mic. It's right on the instrument. You don't need a ton of gain. You can put it in the monitors. You can put it in the subs, and you're done. I know, the, Usually a little bit of roll, low roll off from the resonance of the yeah, instrument. Yeah, I was going to say, because the 57 I just seems like it would, re- like the cello, it sounded great, but on the bass, it just seems like all that resonance would kind of get into it. Well, you gotta, yeah, you got to manage your bass. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not a set it and forget it thing. You, you are going to need to go in and tweak because it'll resonate yeah. like heck in the wedges. Right. Um, if they're big ones, you know, or if you have big side fills or something. Um, and, you know, it can depending on the size of the stage and the space, like it, you can create a feedback loop through your subs. Yeah. Um, wow. but that's, I've had the easiest time with that. Uh, now let's go to violin. No pickup. Violin, no pickup. Uh, there again, I've used C3000s, 1000s, 57. You just kind of get above them and say, yeah, stand above under them this. Like try to, yeah, pretty much. Well, I mean, the 3000, they can kind of stand away from it and it just picks right. up. But what, if, what if they need it in the wedge, though? No, I've actually had pretty good luck with the 3000 because it's a very hot mic. So, oh, yeah. you know, you can drop a pencil 30 feet away and it'll pick it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've liked a lot, even even a live outdoor setting, I use this uh, C430. Um, oh, yeah. On Sunday mornings, you got a killer violin player, but usually what I'll do is I'll strap uh, SM81 over top of him uh, in between. You yeah. know, if, if he's holding it, I don't know if that would necessarily have enough mid range. I haven't actually tried that one. Well, but. it like outdoors, it was nice because I got what I wanted out of it. Because okay. she wasn't doing anything in the mid or low range. Oh, okay. Um, but in the high range, it really cuts through. Yeah, and it's nice, but it'll still blend in. The SM81's the See, same that's way. Where I would go with the 1000 because it's still got the top end, but it's got a little bit more fullness in the mid range. Yeah. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> my little trick for those, I, I'll often use just a 57 on a, a stand, boom stand up overhead. Um, have used condensers, pencil mics. Uh, I've used an SM81. I have used a 430, although when you have to start dialing it up in the wedges, it's a hot mic and real wide. Um, yeah. So you got to be careful to aim that sucker upstage and be careful of drum bleed. Um, but violinists, they wander. I mean, right. even if their feet stay in the same spot, their torso can be all over the place. Um, I actually just got into this uh, on a forum yeah, with a guy. Yeah, because the 430 is hypercardioid, whereas the 3000 I can do cardioid or... Right, one thousand two. So yeah, four thirty. I don't know. I'll do lav mic. I'll get a wireless lav. Oh, yeah. or, uh, Put it, a countryman over their ear. Yep, you yeah. can do a countryman oh, over the ear. That sounds gorgeous. Um, I like the Shure ninety three pickup. It's the little. Yeah tiny tiny square little pickup yep. um, that one works the best you can put it right on their collar if they're wearing yeah, one I don't have one of those I've, those, I've, whatever the audio technical ones I do have I have used those before with some good oh results. yeah the 30 the, the unless 35s. you're in like you know like baroque costume yeah those little a those little times, and it's like there's too much <laughs> ruffling going on there yep. yeah if you use those 35s <laughs> that we use on toms and horns uh, you can clip one of those right to the chin rest and get it kind of up over sort of between the strings in an f hole get good results um, but yeah, lav mic, I'll clip it to a hat, I'll clip it to a collar. In a worst case scenario, I'll clip it to a shirt even below the instrument, and it'll yep. still get enough. And that that's the one nice thing that I've got about the countryman is it's, it's over the ear. So you put it over their left ear where they're playing. Um, it's right it's, there. It's locked oh in. Oh, my gosh. It's because... It's John, right can we use my is. Bluetooth off the iPhone and then into this? <laughs> my, my Bluetooth's from Eddie Blue, by the way, which John <laughs> heard at 60 miles an hour and not heard the wind. Pretty convincing. <laughs> right, yeah. But, but the countryman comes through every time because it's, it's what the violinist wants to hear out of their instrument. So right. if they're playing well, that's what they're hearing, and that's what it's they a, expect yeah. yep. to hear out of the instrument, which yep. comes through great with a nice violin player. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw one more at you, and then we should probably wrap it up. Is that a phone? That's that's where I was going. Bell, <laughs> bells, uh, uh, how do we want to call that? Like tuned percussion of any sort. So like xylophone bells, tubular bells. Um, See, that all depends. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are such a wide range of percussive bells and such 
to deal with. Well, talk and spiel, anyone? Talk, talk it up. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I ran into actually a very tiny xylophone. What was it a week or two ago? Sorry, I'm a little bit on tour time yet. But what? Oh, okay. Popping. Yeah, but uh, so tiny little xylophone fits in like you know a 19 inch case, something like that. Used a 57 over that. You know, you start getting into the bigger things that you're actually seeing in an orchestra. Start looking at condensers and larger diaphragms and just something that just sounds good overall, like something you would want to do a stereo recording with just to capture everything you've got. Uh, generally, I prefer to get a little distance on that. Just to get a little bit of room resonance if you can. I'm assuming if you're doing anything with that, it's probably not a rock band, although I'm right. sure it's happened. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what I've done a few times with it um, in a... a alive but kind of more ref- not refined but less volume driven setting um is i'll drop a figure eight mic on top of it yeah um and angle that down just a touch so you get um not necessarily a stereo pan out of it, especially i mean if you're in a mono room it doesn't really right. do a whole lot but it'll like where that midsection yeah, drops out separate it'll right you, you get a nice separation of sound you get a, a transition between your lows and your highs if, if somebody's banging on both ends at the same time which I haven't run into personally. Um, it gets a little bit, a little bit furry, and you gotta you now gotta you put tweak the backside the low towards the lows or the highs. Um, the all the weaker side I usually put towards the lows because that's, I mean, in in a group setting that's not what you're looking for. Right. If if it's a solo instrument thing, then you have two mics on it. That's just yeah. you gotta yeah. do that if you can. And I would put a, a 57 on top and. If I could, like a, a, a 52 on the bottom, I guess. But if I've just got one mic, um, the KSM 44 with a touch of the ro- low end rolled off, um, put on 160, and then figure eight over the, pretty much the middle of it usually gets me a nice sound. Right on. All right. Well, we're over time, so um, we'll skip pianos. It's probably a whole other show, and we could easily oh, do we a can probably show or skip two. like the first 25 minutes. We could easily do a whole show on mic and guitars, and I'm sure there's a few other oddball choices. Um, so anyway, we're going to wrap it up right here. If you've got uh, an instrument miking question, please hit us up. Uh, you can find the blog at smart, the number two, noise.blogspot.com. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, which is not real interesting to watch because it's just the logo, but uh, the uh, that address has been popped up there the whole time. Um, check out the blog. Drop us a line there. You can find us. We've got a page on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We've got a page on Google Plus that... I ignore like everybody else. Uh, I should say like neglected since I was gonna 2011. Say, I, I yeah. vaguely remember setting one up. I've got one somewhere. I've got the app on my phone. Yeah. 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 It's, it's been there. doesn't do anything. It's red now, I think. <laughs> it's, it used to be black. Um, but yeah, hit us up. If you've got questions about miking, we'd love to hear them. We'd love to chime in on them. Or uh, if you've got your own uh, Theater techniques. Organ. Sorry, did I say that? Do what? <laughs> Theater organ. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Um and uh yeah okay that's it i'm not going to do my usual spiel where i I beg for attention but uh i'm going to beg for attention uh get in get in touch with us we'd love to know you're out there we'd love to know you're reading and listening on russia what you think yeah first person to to send us a a greeting in russian (laughs) gets mentioned (laughs) get your picture on the blog you'll be famous at least with the the 2,000 people a month that read us and the 20th week that listen to us um, so anyway, we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, who knows what the next show will be about? We may pick this topic up and run with it. Um, I'm also trying to get a couple drummer friends. I have a couple of guys who toured as drummers, uh, drum techs. One's a drum builder. Actually, I got three, probably four drummers I could get together all in a room. That that might get See ridiculous. See if we get wow. teaspoon in on that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Some sweet gospel chops. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'm so tired that I completely lost my train of thought. What are we? What were we doing? You're wrapping up the show. Wrapping yeah, up the show. Yeah. That's right. Wrap up in a blanket and fall asleep by the fire. <laughs> so that's it. That's the show for this week. Uh, get in touch. Let us know what you want to hear about, and we are going to call that a wrap.